I was, when I accepted the invitation to come here, I was asked to talk about uh, my personal journey to becoming a leader. That was a huge shock to me because I've never given a minute, a minute's thought. And um, it's caused me to do a great deal of reflecting and thinking. And I've realized that what, I've, what I'm going to say today is not really just about that, but it's about weaving together why I've become a leader, why I'm so passionate about nursing, and why I'm so passionate about primary health care. So, so bear with me when I try and take you through that journey. Now, is that changing? Am I pushing the right button? No. How did you do it so smoothly, Rosemary? Oh, I am pressing the arrow really hard. <laughs> Come back, quick. <laughs> it's a great start, isn't it? I'm pressing that arrow really hard. Where do I need to point it? Oh, because you, Rosemary, you left me the wrong one. Okay, that's okay. I think when I tried to think about, so, so who am I and why have I done what I've done, I realised what I've, what I've had from the very beginning is a real distaste for the hegemony of biomedicine. And I need to really clarify that and say, it's not that I've got anything against doctors because I think they do really, really important work. Of course they do. We all work alongside that. What I don't like and have never liked is the natural leadership of medicine for the whole of healthcare because healthcare is about something infinitely more than medicine and that's driven me from the start. Personally, I have a very strong focus on the gentleness and compassion one needs. My nursing gentleness and compassion has always translated into similar feelings for colleagues and for nursing students. I'm strongly grounded in social justice issues. I think the marriage between social justice concern and nursing, and particularly primary health care nursing, is a strong, permanent, and long-standing relationship that we should never forget. And through my academic studies, I've developed an absolute fascination with the complex relationship between knowledge, language, and power. The other thing I thought about, it's been a really good exercise, is that actually right at the beginning I had an absolutely overinflated sense of my own ability. And the reason I say that is that I've got a very strong memory of being a student nurse in a very busy surgical ward in those grim days when the only staff nurse on duty went home at six o'clock. And instead of being terrified, I was thrilled. <laughs> and I'm, I'm appalled to look back and think how little I knew and how dreadfully, dreadfully unsafe those patients probably were, but I just wanted to get stuck in and be in charge. And I don't know what that says, but it's a worry. <laughs> I read a very influential paper way back in the 80s by Yarling and McElmurray, which made the statement that nurses are conceived in moral contradiction and born in compromise. And I so strongly identified with that. And I see some of you nodding. We are educated in a particular way. We are educated to do certain things and we very rarely get the opportunity to do those to their fullest extent. And Yarling and McElmurray concluded that paper by saying, set the nurses free, set the nurses free. And as a leader, that's a mandate for me, a, a, a driving force is until we have set nurses free from the shackles that constrain their practice, we will not make the necessary impacts on the health system. I also um, am quite intrigued by, and I'm gonna to have to put my glasses on now, it's bloody awful getting into your 60s. Um, I also read a number of papers, uh, a particular paper by Marianne Lovell in 1982, where she made the statement that medicine practices paternalistic deception on nurses to lure them into believing that nurses and physicians can work as a team with the physician as the natural team captain. Now, that was in 1982, and I think looking out there, most of us would say that that hasn't changed at all. And then you can sit back and say, well, does that matter? Well, my argument today is, yes, it does matter because primary health care does not have natural leadership through medicine. It has natural leadership through someone who's, who's absolutely grounded in health, 
has a strong commitment to social justice and understands the powerful impact of context on how people experience and access health care. So again, that's not to say that doctors don't make a vital contribution, of course they do, but it isn't an appropriate way to design and lead primary health care services. Um, this, is, this just amuses me when you look back at medical journals from the 1960s. Um, a nurse must feel like a girl, act like a lady, think like a man and work like a dog. And I, I, don't, I don't think anyone would dare write that anymore, but what we need to be alert to is, is anyone still thinking it? In my own academic career, I've done now many, many years of community-based research, working particularly with um, a large, large cohort of people living with long-term conditions and very complex comorbidities. And what that research has shown me in a, in a number of different ways and has been very much part of my development is that the health system so clearly benefits some people so much more than others and it continues to fail other people entirely. And none of us find that acceptable. Politicians, doctors, nurses, we don't find it acceptable. But what's different for nurses is that on a minute by minute, 24 seven basis, we see and work alongside the consequences of the system failing a number of people. It's very interesting to me that even, I mean, in New Zealand particularly, we launched a primary health care strategy in the year 2001, I think, and it contained the statement that primary health care nurses would be critically developed, critical to the implementation of the strategy. And yet in 2013, we are still struggling politically, policy, professionally, to actually bring our contribution to primary health care to the front of the table. And my question, my constant question, is why do we struggle so hard to justify our presence, our leadership, our, our presence at decision-making tables? Because my experience has been of a great deal of, ch of talk, a huge amount of rhetoric, and very little actual concrete change. And this is a cartoon which I think captures it beautifully. We, put, we keep um, doing what we've always done and expecting to get something different. And we absolutely are not getting anything different because we haven't made the very fundamental technical changes that need to occur to free nurses to deliver primary health care. And uh, <laughs> what I'm kind of thinking here is that old habits die hard. <laughs> and <laughs> the health system is locked into a number of very deeply embedded old habits. And they are proving incredibly difficult to change. Every journal article you pick up, every bit of the grey literature, political rhetoric, um, health workforce, you have Health Workforce Australia, we have Health Workforce New Zealand, we have a Ministry of Health, they constantly talk about the need to transform the healthcare system. And, you know, Rosemary brought up very clearly the, the things that are facing us all in health around rising chronicity, ageing populations, diminishing workforce. Um, but we can't seem to move beyond, or have our, our policymakers move beyond the hand-wringing and the telling us how bad it's going to get. And yet in New Zealand in nursing, we have a very clear, concise list of the things that need to be changed at the policy level to free us up to stop the tsunami of disaster which is facing us. We still, in our country, and I sense here it's not much different, we still don't seriously address wastage, fragmentation, medicalisation and inappropriate use of workforce capacity. We are still not using the potential of nurses. And one of the reasons for that is that it, funding is almost entirely directed towards diagnosis and treatment. And it's much less available for the things that really matter to people, and most certainly for people living with long-term conditions. And the funding sources for all the things that we care about, wellness promotion, um, health promotion, helping people live uh, a good quality of life, those funding streams are always contestable, always at risk, always asking for evidence. 
but it flows the other way without question. And in New Zealand, when we launched the primary healthcare strategy, we have made some quantum leaps towards more proactive primary healthcare. But even 13 years later in New Zealand, we are still largely delivering our services through a medical model of care rather than a systems or person-centred model of care, even though we've had that rhetoric for a long time. When I look around, I see that nursing is critically aware of it. I see that nursing is very anger, angry about it, but clearly feels quite powerless to change it. And one of the things I've come to understand is that instead of being sad about this, we should be actually really mad and really angry. There are an awful lot of us, and if we got collectively really angry, it would be quite something to behold. But we tend, in fact, to turn our sadness and our anger inwards. We tend quite often to focus it on each other, and we tend to feel like victims. And somehow we have to move beyond that positioning. And one of the things that has made our primary healthcare strategy uh, fail to be, or has caused its implementation to be a failure, is that we've, uh, we've made the assumption that all our energies, all our policy change and all our fun funding should be directed through general practitioners. And therefore we have not seen the changes that we would have anticipated. And this is just a quote, a very recent quote from the Nuffield Trust in Britain, which I, I'm sure you can read. But they also are starting to say, actually, general practitioners are trained in biomedicine and they have a particular view of the world and a particular way of working and maybe it's been wrong to expect that they will lead the kind of change in primary health care that we were anticipating. And in New Zealand, at least, GPs constantly talk about the fact that they provide continuity of care, and most of us know that that's simply not happening any longer. And they're also often very arrogant about the potential contribution of other members of the team. And I just want to share with you an email that we, um, we were sent about three or four months ago. One of my colleagues sent out an invitation to all of the primary health care practitioners in North Auckland, inviting them to a day she'd set up looking at innovations and developments in primary health care from a multidisciplinary perspective. And this is the email she received back from one person. Now, I don't, I don't wish to suggest for a moment that that represents how all GPs think, but I think it is a little bit um, representative of why we are struggling so hard to have a truly respectful multidisciplinary team in which all members of the team value the different input of team members and realise that teams are bigger than individuals and that teams that work, work well together deliver the best kind of services to clients and patients. Because health services are currently largely focused and funded around diagnosis and treatment, we, we take the leadership of doctors for granted as a seeming common sense assumption. And this has some particularly profound consequences, and I've, I've come to see it like this, and I, I hope that makes sense. But if you look, look at it, diagnosis and treatment are actually a very small part of most people's journey through life and through an illness and through particularly long-term conditions. Diagnosis and treatment is a short, sharp period, but actually people go on for years and years and years living with what's wrong with them. Or people have many, many years before they get sick where, in fact, we should be working alongside them to ensure that their lifestyle, their access to health services, their access to screening and prevention are as good as they can possibly be. And so I think we've got things upside down. All our money, all our focus, all our energy goes into the diagnosis and treatment end, and, yet, and nursing very rarely leads services or determines how services are designed. And so our model is upside down, and we need to turn it over. It just intrigues me hugely as to why nursing as the largest health professional group has accepted this anomaly for so long. And I even wonder how many nurses actually see how upside down the model is. 
Where we need to come to is, and, and again, I'm, I'm now speaking how I see this as a leader, is that we actually do need to own a collective vision. I think that vision is there, but we're not articulating it loudly and proudly. We need to feel very powerful and clear about our vision, and we need to trust those who can to drive the vision forward. Now, sometimes doing that in nursing is quite difficult. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's, it's true that many, many nurses actually will say to you, it's my God-given right to go home and read the Woman's Weekly and not give nursing another thought. And I kind of respect that. There are an awful lot of nurses who are working very hard, caring for elderly patients, parents, bringing up children, studying, and, yeah, they've had enough. But there are movers and shakers among our profession. We need to get behind them. We need to actively, vociferously, and powerfully support them, even if we don't personally have the courage, the energy, or the voice to do it ourselves. For me, the vision as a leader of nursing is that we need to develop our partnerships with consumers much more strongly than we have. Midwifery in New Zealand did this very effectively by partnering with birthing women and together challenging the legislation that meant that uh, midwives were not able to be lead maternity carers. And of course that all happened way back in the 80s and now something like 80, nearly 90% of all New Zealand women have a midwife as their lead maternity carer. For us, our consumer groups are much more diverse, but I still think our focus should be on building strong alliances with um, consumers so that we focus away from poor us and focus on those we serve. And we need to stop thinking about the contracts, the employment um, relationships, the organisational structures that constrain our practice and think about how could we better align what we do with, con with consumer need. There's not a simple overnight endeavour. Endeavour We need to make a start. In New Zealand, the College of Nurses has formed consumer alliances with aged concern, with rural women, and that's the rural women one is pr proving particularly um, productive in terms of that rural women see very strongly the consequences of the absence of services in rural areas. And so together with them on the Rural Health Alliance, we've been able to become a very powerful advocate for the development of the nurse practitioner role in rural areas. I want to kind of wind down, I'm not right at the end yet, but move now to talking about leadership styles because I think they are particularly important and this also came up in my endless reflections about, about being a leader. I think in health we have more of this kind of finger waving, um, you will do as I say leadership. I'm much more interested in a more equal form of leadership, a leadership which is about passing the baton from one to the other. And for me as a leader, what's been particularly important is mentoring and growing the people coming along who so clearly have far more capacity than I do and have much longer ahead of them to be a leader. However, I think there's a distinction to be made here about whether the leadership is positional or disciplinary. What I see happening is that nurses get locked into position, leadership positions, which then have a, sent, a set of constraints around them. They feel they can't talk, they feel they can't act, they feel they can't speak to the media because their employee relationship and their commitment to their organisation has some constraints around it. And so often some of our strongest leaders have their leadership wasted for the discipline because they're organisationally constrained. And so we need to think much more clearly about disciplinary leadership. And that's the leadership that has nothing to do with who employs you or where you work, but is where and how you are a voice for consumers and for nursing, and for nursing and consumer partnership. And that leadership, of course, comes through professional organisations and it comes through our academics. And I'm personally disappointed that many of my academic colleagues in New Zealand who have a constitutional freedom to say what they like when they like actually don't use it. And that's one of life's mysteries for me that I hope to solve before I die. 
because disciplinary leadership has huge freedom. And I've chosen to use that freedom, and I don't know why other people don't. So when we come back to servant leadership, which is the leadership style that I would personally embrace, it's a style that I think works really well for nursing because it's about developing people. It's about being participatory and collaborative. And it's about looking at other people and working how to grow their strengths and their capacity to give them courage. You know, it gives me real pleasure now to look back on people who've come into my office at some stage and said, if you think I'm doing a master's degree, you can think again. And there are one or two of them. And I now watch them with that master's degree under their belt, sometimes with a PhD under their belt, and providing extraordinary leadership within nursing. And more of us need to be shoulder tapping the people who, because as women, and many of us are, most of us are women in nursing, we have this terrible thing called imposter syndrome, which is a, a kind of belief that we're not as bright or as smart or as clever as other people, and it holds us back hugely. So the characteristics of servant leadership are these. And these are characteristics which for me work really well because they're characteristics that come quite naturally to a great deal of nurses. And for me it makes perfect sense to take these characteristics into our capacity as leaders and use them to both role model a more effective style of leadership and to grow other people as leaders. Servant leaders, in working the way they do, recognise that when we have this more common, distant, arrogant, intimidating and top-down leadership, what it does is suppress the capacity, capability and potential of other people. And I think that's happening a lot in New Zealand. I think in this very room there will be a great many potential leaders who have had that urge crushed out of them by the relationships they've had with employers, by other nurse leaders, um, with medical staff, doesn't matter. We do tend to crush the confidence of colleagues to take on leadership. People are vulnerable, and being a leader for me is recognising that vulnerability in other people and nurturing people beyond that vulnerability. Because all of us, each and every one of us, whether we work in universities, hospitals, general practices, primary health, school clinics, whatever, the current health climate is a very challenging and demanding one, and it's pretty harsh on individuals. In health, we restructure almost constantly, with little point. There is no empirical evidence that restructuring ever gains or achieves the goals it sets out, but we keep doing it over and over again. We waste an enormous amount of people's energy restructuring. Uh, there's a lot of talk about hard outcomes, and nurses generally don't relate so well to hard outcomes because people don't look like hard outcomes. And there's a value on product over person. And so the cultures that we work in are not comfortable cultures for nursing leadership. And they tend to destroy rather than foster leadership, and they tend to encourage people to see leadership as a dangerous and pointless exercise. And I think that's exactly how a lot of nurses see leadership. Why would I go there? So in terms of concluding where I think we should focus our leadership, we need to actually focus 100% and exclusively on patients, clients and community need as the sole basis for justifying and determining how we deliver our services. So if who's employing us, the way we're employed, or what our contract says is not meeting the needs of our clients or consumers, then it needs to be challenged loudly and angrily at times. We need to nurture and grow our leadership capacity through that servant-type leadership. We don't need to be like anyone else, we can grow our own form of leadership. But we do need to assume and own power over, deployment, over the deployment of our own services. And very few of us have that power. And if there's one statement that drives me insane in nursing, is nurses telling me they're not allowed to do something. 
I hear that over and over and over again in master's classes. Well, we're not allowed to do that. And when you say, who says? Nobody's actually sure. They just say, well, we're not allowed to do that. But they've never gone looking to find out whether the world would stop spinning if they actually did it. And in line with this, I want to just challenge you to think very closely about our micro behaviours. And people laugh at me in New Zealand because they go about this on about this all the time. But we do have ways of presenting ourselves which really allow other professions and clients and patients not to take us seriously. I don't know what you have here. My pet hate in New Zealand is the terrible badges nurses wear made out of FIMO and with their Christian name on them. And they think they'll be treated as a serious professional, um, health professional. We, in New Zealand, practice nurses very rarely have their own name and credentials on the door of their office, if they're lucky enough to have an office. Outside general practices, the GPs are listed, the physios are listed, the midwives are listed, but it never looks like nurses even work there. Now why? Why have nurses never said, excuse me, I work here too, why is my name on the, on the board? This might seem like a very trivial behaviour, but believe me, it multiplies out into our invisibility, into our taken for grantedness, and into a sense that we're actually just there to help somebody else with their great work. And that's what I mean about micro behaviours. We use disempowering language, we talk about ourselves as girls at work, we allow people to call us the girls. We often use medical practitioners' titles and surnames and allow them to call us by our Christian name. I'm perfectly comfortable with Christian names, they just need to go both ways. There are all sorts of embedded power differentials, and here you can see my fascination with the relationship between knowledge, language, and power. The, the way we present ourselves has allowed the public, when I was doing this long-standing chronic illness research, whenever I asked um, patients about the practice nurse, quite often they weren't sure who that person was. Quite often they confuse that person with the receptionist, with the girl who takes my blood off at the laboratory, and we have to own that invisibility as being part of the way we present ourselves. So leading in nursing for me means actually believing in yourself, but part of believing in yourself is relating that belief to something bigger than yourself and that's the people we serve. Even if you struggle to think that you're important or valuable or clever, you have much less trouble recognising that the people we serve have immense unmet need and that services frequently fail to meet people's needs. That needs to be our driving passion. And then you have to make the decision as to whether you're going to be a frontline leader all the time, some of the time, or whether you're going to be a supporter of good leaders and leadership organisations. But if every single one of us did one of those two, we would become a much more um, noticeable force for shaping the way healthcare services need to change. Now, I think I've finished ahead of time, which will be very helpful for you, I hope.